Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today we're solving map of highest peak. So this is a very classic and good problem in my opinion. I would say the solution to this problem is almost identical to two problems in the neat code 150 list. Uh, this list over here that I think most of you guys probably already know about, but in the graph section, there is uh, two problems, walls and gates and rotting oranges. That has a very, very similar solution to today's problem. And if you want to like look at those problems, you can uh, see them here. Uh, but let's get into this problem now. The idea is... I'll kind of give my own explanation rather than like reading through all of this. We are given a binary matrix. I know that doesn't look like a binary matrix over here, but imagine that what we were originally given looked something like this. First row is 0, 1. Next row is 0, 0. So specifically what this means is that zeros are land cells and ones are water cells. It's a little bit backwards, at least from what I would expect. And then we're given a couple rules. So I think one of the hard things about this problem is probably just trying to interpret it. What they are telling us is that we must assign a height to every one of these positions. What we're given is not the height itself. Zero is not really a height. One is not a height. All this means is that we have to assign each of these positions a height. The good thing for us is we actually don't need to assign a height to the water cells. That is actually given to us. The height of those must be zero. So when we create the output matrix for that corresponding position, obviously we're going to have a zero in that spot. So that's like the easy part. The rest of the heights must be non-negative. Zero is technically non-negative, so that's fine. And this is probably the most significant part. Any two adjacent cells must have an absolute height difference of at most one. So when you look here, this is the output matrix. Like this is the result that we would return. You can see that down here. And you can see that it indeed is the case. These two adjacent positions have a difference of at most one. These two have a difference of at most one. These two are not technically adjacent. When we say adjacent, we only mean the four directions. And this guy indeed has an absolute difference of at most one here and at most one here. So why is this the result? I mean, technically it does meet all the conditions, but why did we pick this matrix? Couldn't we have also made this guy a one? Or we could have also made everything in here a zero. That is technically non-negative and the absolute differences are zero. Well, the reason we didn't do that is because what we're trying to do is find the matrix such that the maximum height in the matrix is maximized. So right now the maximum height is two and indeed it is maximal. There's no way to actually create a matrix that follows these conditions that has a value greater than two. It's not possible. And I think it's kind of obvious in this small example why that's not possible because think about this for a second. In this matrix over here, we knew that zero has to go in the top right position. And then from that zero, if we're asking, okay, for my neighbors, I only have two neighbors. What is the max possible value that could go here? Well, it's probably one because that's one bigger than the previous value. Since we're trying to find the overall maximum value, we're trying to get the maximum height somewhere in the matrix. We should try to be greedy. If our value currently is X, whatever you want to call it, X is equal to zero right now, then our neighbor should always be X plus one because X plus one is the maximum value we could put here because we need to make sure that the difference stays uh, one. So for both of the neighbors from that guy, we will obviously put a one. We're trying to be greedy and ultimately we'll end up with a two over here. And then this is the matrix that we would return. Now, what I kind of just did right now was from the water, we pretty much performed a traversal. Specifically, in this case, it was kind of a breadth first search traversal where we went layer by layer and we said, okay, this uh, first layer from the water source is going to be one. The next layer is going to be two. And if we had a larger matrix, then we would kind of keep expanding each layer. It's easy enough when you only have a single water cell, but what happens when you have multiple water cells? Suppose we are given a three by three matrix. So the original matrix looked something like this. 
we had a one over here and a one over here, and then the rest of these were zeros. And so what that really means is that we would create our own output matrix, initializing everything to be empty except for these two, which would end up being zero. And then what we would want to do is from each of these water cells at the same time, we want to run a BFS from both of these at the same time. What it is specifically called is a multi-source BFS. The good thing is that implementing it is pretty similar to just implementing BFS. So if you're familiar with that, you should be good to go. If not, you should consider checking out neatcode.io to really understand this fundamental algorithm that comes up a lot. The idea behind BFS is that we usually have some kind of a queue data structure. So I will draw that down here. It's kind of hard to draw it, mainly because we're going to be using like the coordinates of this grid, which are going to be uh, something like this. And then initially what we want to do is add both of these to the queue at the same time. So we would have something like uh, one zero in the queue and then uh, zero two in the queue. I won't like draw too much of this part, but just know that what we're going to be doing is popping. So we pop this, which is going to be this guy. And then we're going to look in all four directions at its neighbors and give them a height one greater than this one. So for all three of the neighbors, we give them a height of one. We know that that's the maximum they could possibly have because they are right next to a zero right now. Then we pop one more time. We pop the zero two. This guy, we look in all four directions. There's only two valid directions. We don't want to go out of bounds. So that's something we'll have to keep in mind when we code this up. But uh, for this part, we just look at the two neighbors and we give them a one and a one over here. When we added these like five neighbors, we would have also added the coordinates of these five neighbors into the queue. So let's just arbitrarily uh, start with one of these three. Let's say I ended up doing this one. Well, I would look in all four directions. It's mainly just this direction, and we would give it a two. And then I would probably end up popping the rest of these. So right now I pop this, 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 and let's say I go through here next. I'm going to look in all four directions. Everything's already been filled. Like this guy's already been filled. Down here is already filled. So we don't need to do anything. We don't want to revisit the same position twice. We don't want to say, let's give this guy a height of two because this one had a height of one. That's not possible because this is right next to a zero. So once we fill in a cell, we know that we're done. We know we've already given it the max possible value. If we see it again, do not assign it a new value. Um, after that, we will end up popping this, popping this, and then eventually I think we'll get here or here. Well, I think this will be first. So we'll pop from here. We'll look down. We can give it a one plus one, which is two. So we're done with this. Eventually we would pop here and realize we have nowhere to go. We'll pop here again, nowhere to go. We filled in every single cell. We pushed it and popped it from the queue in order and we are done. You can see that if I, well, you can't really see all the values here, but it is identical to the matrix on the left. You can see we have a couple zeros in uh, these spots and then these two are twos. Everything else is a one. So this is the idea behind this problem. It's a breadth first search that has multiple starting positions similar to the hard problem that we solved earlier, but this problem I think is just much more reasonable, much more easy, but conceptually it's the same. So let's code this up. In my original code, I had three values pushed to the queue. I don't know if that's actually more simple for people or not. I think you don't actually need to have three values in the queue. You can actually not have the height. So when I code it up now, I'm gonna try to do it without the height. And yeah, this is just a BFS from the water. So I'm going to start with a little bit of boilerplate. First here, I'm just getting the dimensions of the is water grid. It's a binary matrix to start with zeros and ones. I'm going to have a queue and I'm going to have a visit hash set. So what I'm going to do here first phase one is get all water cells and add them to the queue. So I guess I could say and queue all water cells. So we're going to go through the entire matrix. That's pretty straightforward. With some nested loops, we can check for each cell is water at this position. If it's one, that means it's water. Otherwise, it's not. So I could uh, check if it's equal to one or just leave it as is. And I want to do a few things here. One, I want to add these coordinates to the queue. This is a water cell, so we want to start our BFS from this cell. I also 
when I enqueue a node, I want to mark it as visited because I don't want to ever add the same node to the queue multiple times. So I can say visit dot add row column. You could probably get around not using a visit hash set and just use the matrix that we're going to end up returning in the output. But I'll continue to use a visit hash set just to keep things uh, simple. So I'm going to have my result. It's going to be a matrix, which is going to be all zeros initially. I could also make it all negative ones. And I guess I'll actually do that just to be a bit more readable. And so this will have this many values in a given row and will have this many uh, columns or rather this many rows. Sorry. So this is just a matrix of the same dimensions as the iswater matrix with a bunch of negative ones filled in. So now in this loop, we can say that since this is a water cell at this position, in the output, it will have a value of zero, not negative one. And so after this, we can start our BFS. It might be a multi-source BFS depending on how many water cells we had, or maybe it'll just be a regular BFS. That's what I mean by this part of the code is pretty cookie cutter. It's pretty simple. It's always just BFS. This is the part where we have multiple sources in our BFS. So down here, all I can say is while Q, a Q dot pop left, we get the row column coordinates. And to get the height of these coordinates, well, that's the good part. We can just look at our result and then say this height is equal to that. Next, we want to go through the four neighbors of this current position. So first, I'm just going to create an array of neighbors so we don't have to have like repeated code. We can just loop through the four neighbors and each of them is going to be a one position adjacent. So row plus one column plus one, uh, row minus one, and column minus one. Next, we will go through those neighbors, so like this, and we can unpack each neighbor row and neighbor column as we kind of go through it, say array of pairs. And so what we ultimately want to do is this. We want to append to the queue this neighbor, neighbor row, neighbor column. We also want to mark it as visited, so we can say visit, now that it's been added to the queue, we can add it to the visit hash set as well. And lastly, we can give it a height. That's kind of the most important part. We know that the neighbor that we just came from had a height of this. And we know that this is the first time we're visiting this neighbor. So we can give it a height in the result of plus one. So H uh, plus one. And that's for the neighbor, not the original. So let's do this. Now, the only problem here is that we don't know that this position hasn't been visited yet, and we don't even know if it's in bounds. So let's check that first. Let's check if the row was out of bounds or the column was out of bounds in either direction. So n row is equal to rows or n column is this. In that case, we would continue to the next iteration of the loop and we would skip this code down here. There's one other thing that we need to check for, and I'll add that condition down here which is that this position has already been visited. So if this pair is in the visit hash set, then once again, we can skip that iteration. And after all of that is done down here, we can return the result. So provided I don't have any bugs, this code should work. And yes, you can see here it works. It is pretty efficient, I can promise you that. At least in terms of big O runtime, I'm guessing that the hash set is part of the reason that maybe we could slightly improve the runtime. So actually, let me try that very quickly. So let's get rid of the visit hash set and see if we can work without it. So here, I added it to visit. I can get rid of that. And let's say negative ones are unvisited spots. So negative one is equal to unvisited. And we can use those semantics to fix the rest of this code. So rather than checking if this position is in visit, we can check if uh, the result at new row, new column, is not equal to negative one, because if that's the case, that means it's already been visited. And so down here, we also don't have to mark it as visited, and we also don't have to do anything. I think this is marking it as visited implicitly. So hopefully I didn't miss anything, and I can just run this code as is. It's kind of hard to see all of it at the same time, so hopefully if I just zoom out a bit, I guess. But this is the final code. And yes, you can see it actually does work, and it looks like it did actually make a measurable difference. It looks like it was twice as fast as the previous solution. But in terms of big O runtime, I can promise you that the solution didn't change, but uh, practically speaking, it did make it more efficient. If you found this helpful, definitely check out Neatcode.io. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.